Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. So, welcome back. It's our custom to go around and say our names. Um, so, I'll start. My name is Cass. My name is Grisha. My name is Tony. I'm Jim. Don. Ian. Mark. Uh, Muddy, Frank, Greg. My name is Christian. David. My name is Stephen. My name is Tony. Tom. Marty. Tim. I'm Tom. Ray. I'm Richard. My name is Joe. I'm Bob. Peter. <coughs> Peter. Gary. I'm Tom. Oh, thanks. My name is Jerry. My name is David. I'm Ed. I'm Larry. I'm so well. I should have asked before we st- we went around, but is anybody here for the first time or join or um, back after a long absence? What's your name again, please? Tom. Tom. Welcome. Ian. Hi, Ian. Welcome. Okay, so we're um, blessed to have the Reverend Kiryu Leanne Schaff with us again today. Um, she's the Dharma heir of Zenke Blanche Hartman in the tradition of the Shinryu Suzuki Roshi. Born into a Buddhist family in Vietnam, she began her meditation practice in the insight tradition of Spirit Rock, and her Zoto, Zoto Zen training began at Tassahara Monastery, mm-hmm. where she lived from 2002 to 2005 practiced monastically in Japan and Vietnam, and is a founding member of the Buddhists of Color in 1998. While she has placed her trust and faith in Soto Zen, she continues to enjoy the deep silence of insight practices and has completed retreats in the United States and Thailand. Drawing from her monastic experiences, she endeavors to share ways in which the deep settledness of traditional practices can be brought into everyday life. Leanne's aim as a teacher is incorporating what are typically considered insight techniques to help make Soto Zen practice accessible to all. And her website is accesstozen.org. Welcome. Thank you, Cass. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be back. I will say. A week ago, I just got out of a two-week retreat with Gil, Franz Dahl, so it's, it's great. I have, as I said, I haven't met a retreat I haven't liked. <laughs> <laughs> Moments in a retreat, <laughs> like, certainly not a retreat itself. Um, t- today, I wanted to t- give a talk that um, was from a request. Actually, earlier in the year, I um, co-taught a five-day LGBTQ I, I, two, plus <laughs> retreat at IRC. And um, uh, it was a last minute replacement. And um, so I was the, you know, I do teach Vipassana and Zen. I combine them and, you know, I'm just Zen-ish. And so um, <clears throat> I said some things that uh, someone wrote afterward and said, oh, well, what, what, I'd like to hear more about this thing you said about how Noticing judgmental mind right, and ego is really, um, you know, towards the cause of non-suffering. You know, because mostly, as I, I think I said last time I was here, people hear about practice as you know, first noble truth is there is suffering. So, um, so first, I think a way to talk about that is that um, first there are three. Condition um, laws of existence, or this a Buddhist concept, and you guys know what those are. In a conditioned life, which we are in, there are three laws that 
everyone can't escape. Do you know what they are? Impermanence. One is dukkha, one is impermanence. What's the third? No self. Yes, often uh, uh, translated, anatta, as no self. I myself prefer not self. Because when you say no self, there's a sense of like, what do you mean? Right? <laughs> yes, right? I, see, I see people, That's, there's a self. And um, so not self. So, so now, well, there are three, um, and they're true of all Buddhist practices, of course, since they're laws. Um, dukkha, in, in the way my sense is, and having practice, and I will say it's reified from my two-week retreat, is that, um, well, of course, we're practicing not really to, you know, um, look for more dukkha that happens already. Right? We're looking, we're practicing to see how is it that we experience dukkha, right? Suffering, disease, dissatisfaction, discontent, the translations of dukkha. Um, and so my sense, having practiced both insight and um, Zen, and I haven't practiced Vajrayana, so I can't speak to that, um, the three main sects of Buddhism, is that a lot of insight practice is much more focusing on helping you see impermanence. And when you hang on to permanence, then the likelihood of suffering increases. Okay? This is why in Vipassana, you're always being asked to watch how things come and go, arise and fall. And then we focus much more on seeing how when we hold on to a sense of self, the likelihood of, it, of suffering increases. Now it isn't that we don't have a, a self or an idea of a self, right? Just like we, it's not like we don't have a sense of permanence or, you know, we have that sense, right? Um, it's just that when we hold on to solidifying, right, and making it permanent, and permanence comes into that too. But in Zen, we focus so much on about how we see, when we cling on to a sense of self, um, the chance of suffering increases. And I learned that as when I went to the monastery, and before that, to, just so you have a sense, is that you and I did like five and a, I did five and a half years of Vipassana, and I loved it. Um, and then I went back to Vietnam for the first time after 28 years. And the, the last minute, I decided to move back to go home. And after five months, I was like, eh, not, not home. And I came back, and I actually was incredibly devastated because I just had no sense of who I was and what my purpose in life in a lot of ways was. Um, and so then I was looking for a way to um, do a long retreat. By then, I'd done a one month at, at Spirit Rock. And um, yes, I could have gone to IMS in Barrie to do it there three months, you know, at the time. That's my sense of the longest retreat in America. Um, and, uh, but I have a birth sister and um, she was in Rockridge. So having been gone from her for five plus months, I was like, I wasn't willing to be gone in, si in silence, you know, for three months. So I heard about Ria Mong, who might have taught here when she lived around here. Um, Ilda Gutierrez Baudequin, uh, another Dharma era Blanche, but anyway, she, she and Larry, actually she invited Larry to start the Buddhist Sangha. Now they meet here, but they used to meet at LGBT Center. It was Ilda's uh, idea, because it's right down the street from Zen Center when it first opened, right? So anyways, uh, she had a practice discussion with her and she said, oh, you should go to Tassajara, because at the time, uh, if you've been to Tassajara, it, it's a hot spring. So in the summer, it's a resort. That's how Zen Center makes its money, really. And so if you work the five and a half months, then you get practice credit for two 90-day practice period, two three-month practice period. And at the time, I was like, I don't want to do Zen, but I'll work. And my intention was to you know, do one practice period. Obviously, what happened, right? got bit by the Zen bug, a lot of bugs in the mountains. So, um, so anyway, um, so, so I went in there having very little sense of Zen. And, um, and in fact, the first day, you know, I was in there. You know, in Zen, if you've been, when we give instruction, we just give instruction on posture. That's all Zen instruction. 
for the most part, and counting breath. Right? And then when you go to the zendo, nobody says a word, except there, there were bells, and there were a drum for the time drum, and I'm like, it is so noisy. Right? <laughs> I was like, oh, I just came here for the silence. Right? So anyway, and then after the summer, I stayed for the practice period, and there for the practice period, um, because it is very much a monastic, it, it is the monastery of Zen Center in the fall, and the monastic container has really done well. When I left Tassar and went to Japan to practice formally in a monastery, I was like, wow, thank goodness, because the, the forms have really been translated well. And um, so, uh, one, we all have to wear robes, right? There are lay robes and priest robes, but as, as you, you know, I've seen from pictures, it's all black, right? Uh, ideally, you should have a gray kimono, and you can't wear any other color unless you're an a facial person, a brown robe or a facial person. And so, and then, ideally, you would have a white juban, you know, like a, a kimono but short, like the undershirt, or at least a white uh, t-shirt, right? And you had to have those. There's no question about it. Um, you know, and then if you've been to Zen, all the forms is bowing to the cushion, turn and bow the other way, you know, you go up to the altar if you, if you were doing something, and then you would turn right, this orioki, very, a lot of form, and, um, and then that was the first time that I'd done full prostrations, you guys seen Zen full prostration, you know, we go down, we touch our head to the ground, and then we raise our hand like this. And what we're doing is we're, supposedly the Buddha is standing on our hands, and we just raise, raise the Buddha above us and down, right? That's why you don't flip your hand. <laughs> it's not a good form. You just flip them over your shoulder. So sometimes you feel like that, for sure. But anyway, so that's the form, right? And there was so much talk about how your ego, you know, caused suffering and egolessness, and I was like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about, right? And then, and yet, as the practice period is going on, and this is like maybe I don't know the first third or something, and um, if you haven't guessed, I'm an aversive type, so I mostly think see things I don't like, right? And how things could be different and fix and stuff. So. I notice that, um, you know, all this talk about egolessness, and yet all I saw was ego everywhere. <laughs> like, you know, okay, the form for doing a gasho bow is you bring your hands together, like this, fingers together. Not like this, right? Not like this, but your fingers are together, one fist away from your nose, the top of the finger is the same as your, your nose is, right? Sometimes people say a fist away from your throat, but the instruction I was given is this. Those arms, the forearms, are parallel to the ground as much as possible. You have this space here, and when you bow, you keep the space. You don't collapse into it. Right? So this is the instruction. Of course, the deeper the bow, the more you know. <laughs> so, and it's very Japanese, you know, and it, it is true, like, if you don't like something, like you just do really, but, you know, we find ourselves doing that, right? So, so the forms were that, and then the whole prostration thing, and so I was looking around, and yes, we all have the similar robes, and only priests and lay robes is the only difference, but, you know, people will arrive to the zendo, you know, with their scarf, some are red, some are stripes. I myself had a black and white striped hat that I really like, you know, cap, because it was cold. Um, and then, you know, when people put their hands together, some people are like, you know, there's so much ego there, right? And then some people are like, and you're like, but no ego, right? Where, where's their sense of self? Or, you know, oh, look, those fingers are spread apart. Look how perfect mine is, right? So I just saw a lot of ego. So um, I went into, and being, you know, on a verse of five, I went into see um, uh, a practice leader, Kosha, Kosha McCall. Did you ever teach here? Another blind disciple. But anyways, and um, so I'm complaining about how I don't understand this teaching about egolessness because I just see it everywhere, right? And I will admit, I will admit, 
I saw it in myself, right? And so when I went, I had done any, any full prostrations before. Right? So I, when I go down, I mean, I noticed that when I went down to put, touch my head to the ground and raise my hands, right? I was going like <laughs> military precision, right? That like, and then down, right? Just like that, right? And so I did admit that, but I was just going on and on. And then he quietly said, isn't that the point? And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> and he was like, isn't that the point? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, the point in all these forms, what looks like rules of how to comport ourselves, how to carry our oriyoki bowls, where we place our spoons, or all the forms, you know, that of Zen, is so that we can see the ego arising. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the only point, but it's a point. Right? And it's a huge point to practice because this is... If there wasn't all these rules about how one carry oneself and the utensils, right? It's, it's about the relationship. One way you talk about it is that it's about the relationship to things and then in that, the relationship to people. For instance, in Oriyoki, right? yes, there are a lot of rules about how to open up, how to fold the cloth, where you put your chopsticks, which one goes in which bowl when you're eating, but, and most of the 45, 50 minutes of eating, there are only seven minutes of eating. <laughs> Before they start to serve seconds, and then you know, once everyone is served seconds, only two minutes to eat, right? And then you can't eat in the bowl that you just got food in, right? So there are all sorts of rules about it. And so it's 45, 50 minutes, maybe an hour if they're not very fast. Right? And most of that is chanting and bowing and how they serve you. There are all sorts of forms for how to interact with people. And so it is very much about seeing what happens when um, we're giving rules. We're given container practice, right? That's not just about me. Like it's not, in terms of seeing arising and passing, for the most part, we see it best in ourselves and, and on retreat. It's all about, you know, like, like to, right now I was thinking, oh yeah, I had my Zen, you know, mudra, but I was having a hard time keeping my eyes open because for two weeks of intensive retreat, I've had my eyes closed, right? Remember I used to start in Vipassana, so I just go back to, I have my hoodie, I don't bring my rakasu, you know, I'm like undercover insight person, right? So I had my eyes closed, and so most of us are asked to watch is our own processes. You know, these days, and only, maybe because I go on advanced retreat, advanced practitioner retreats, but they don't even give instruction on how to eat, eat medita meditation, and eating instruction either. either. Right? So it's, it's very much about seeing how our thoughts arise and fall, the sensation of, you know, your foot hurting or whatever, and, and, and seeing that that sense of impermanence is really useful without a doubt, right? And yet, it is very much just internal. And with me, I'm walking slowly, right? But in Zen, so much of it is about relationship with others, with things and then with people. And then that's, that's where, of course, ego can come by just watching your mind, right? I'm gonna, or, or just watching your sensation. You know, I'm gonna sit this long, you know, and watching that, without a doubt, ego can come up in that. And yet, the, it's the interaction outside ourselves that, for me at least, has been my experience, that there's so much ego comes up, right? So, so we start out, just like in meditation, by really being asked where to focus our attention. Right? That's what concentration practice is. Focus it here, here, here. Or there's a broad sense of concentration, but it's really about where to um, focus your awareness. Hmm? Now, so we start out with that, and then the other thing that happens though, is that then you start to have to practice understanding, what, what we say is your field of awareness. Right? What is the field of awareness that you're awareing in? Right? This is why metta is really hot. Right? A sense of loving kindness in the field of awareness. 
or compassion in the field of awareness, the other Brahma Viharas, or joy in the field of awareness, or a sense of equanimity. Um, in Zen, I would say that a lot of our practice is about um, seeing, uh, we talk about the field of awareness in a different way, and we talk about it in the sense of seeing what is absent, right? what is not here. Um, and we focus it on much more in seeing where's the vastness, the vastness of awareness, and where, how is it that what you're perseverating on, in other words, say that what you're clinging onto, right, what you're obsessing about, be either mostly with our thoughts, right, but when we open our eyes, could be about other people, um, and and what happens with that when you see it in context? A lot of practices about seeing things in context. Uh, this is from Zen Mind Beginner's Mind, Suzuki Roshi. This is in the chapter called Control. To live in the realm of Buddha nature means to die as a small being, moment after moment. When we lose our balance, we die. But at the same time, we also develop ourselves. We grow. Whatever we see is changing, Losing its balance. The reason everything looks beautiful is because it's out of balance, but its background is always in perfect harmony. This is how everything exists in the realm of Buddha nature. Losing its balance against a background of perfect balance. So if you see things without realizing the background of Buddha nature, everything appears to be in the form of suffering. But if you understand the background of existence, you realize that suffering itself is how we live and how we extend our life. So in Zen, sometimes we emphasize the imbalance or disorder of life. And it's true, like, I, again, I just went on this retreat, and for some reason, in part my, uh, my, uh, my pity state, my, my rapture state, uh, meditative rapture, I was leaning forward a lot. You know, the energy was just like, leaning forward, and so I was swallowing a lot. And you know, I have been on many retreats, and in fact people ask me, since I teach meditation, should I swallow or not? I'm like, just swallow. <laughs> Nobody really, you know, maybe they'll hear, but it's okay. But I was just swallowing like heck, and so I was having the same thought. Oh my God, only these two people on either side of me, you know, are just bothered by my swallowing, right? Because I swear, it was like, <laughs> swallowing all the time. <laughs> Afterwards, I was talking to one of my left, and I was like, I'm really sorry I was swung so much. He's like, I didn't hear it, right? <laughs> so this is it. Like, the, that's ego. Not, not that that's a bad thing. Ego's not a bad thing, mind you. It's just a sense of self. And, and most for most of us, though, when the sense of self comes up, it's judgmental, right? And that's where the suffering is. And, and, and that's, in a way, I mean, take it, take it off the cushion, right? You know, because... Becoming aware, aware of our queerness is like that. Most of us, maybe you were different, but I, my experience when I first realized I was queer was very judgmental because of all the, you know, homophobia, right? So we have internalized that. Most thoughts we have are somehow evaluative, judgmentative, comparative. That's the discursive mind. And though, when we can see in context, right, in the vast field of awareness, judgmental mind doesn't have to be that big a deal, right? Don't forget that uh, really said, more clearly stated in Dogen would be, right, N not thinking, right, non-thinking, excuse me, non-thinking is zazen, right? Non-thinking isn't that you should stop thinking. Everyone comes to meditation and they think, I, I want to stop thinking. And which are the ones you want, things you want to stop thinking? You're not wanting to stop thinking the pleasant thoughts. I've never heard someone come up and say, can you teach me not to think so pleasantly? We well, want to get rid of the bad thoughts, we think. And yet, really, non-thinking, or beyond thinking sometimes is stated, is that you let thinking just be thinking. It's just what it is. It's just there in the field of awareness. It's just one little thought. It's delusion is when we put a strong belief on things. Right? There are days still, there are moments still in which, you know, I, 
have sense of like, oh, being queer is not such a great thing, right? Especially when you hear some news stories or whatever. But, but then I remember, oh yeah, that's internalized homophobia. It's just a thought I have about that. Here, here is Suzuki Hiroshima. Nowadays, traditional Japanese painting has become pretty formal and lifeless. That is why modern art has developed. No judgment there. <laughs> <laughs> Having been a modern art person myself. Ancient painters used to practice putting dots on paper in artistic disorder. This is rather difficult. Even though you try to do it, usually what you do is arrange in some <coughs> order. You think you can control it, but you cannot. It is almost impossible to arrange your dots out of order. It is the same with taking care of your everyday life. Even though you try to put people <coughs> under some control, it is impossible. You cannot do it. The best way to control people is to encourage them to be mischievous. <laughs> then they will be in control in its wider sense. To give your sheep or cow a large, spacious meadow is the way to control him. So it is with people. Let them do what they want and watch them. This is the best policy. To ignore them is not good. That is the worst policy. The second worst is, to, is trying to control them. <laughs> the best one is to watch them, just to watch them without trying to control them. So he's talking about, you know, people, but really, it's our thoughts about people that we have a hard time with, and it's our thoughts in general. So what is it then to see that our thoughts, the, the sense of urgency about the truth of our thoughts get watered down when the field is larger? And so first we have to notice what kind of thoughts we're having. That's why we have to learn to focus and notice what, what are we thinking, right? And then when you meditate, this is why when you, go, you have to go on long retreats, right? Because in a half an hour, yes, you can see, oh yeah, I've had that thought a hundred times. But on a week retreat, you will see that you've had it thousands of times. And that's when you start to say, oh yeah, May, when you're tired enough, you know, this on the third or fourth day, basically you're just tired, right? And so you start stop fighting. Stop, you start to see where the judgmental mind actually is causing the constriction. And so you, you almost are forced to relax because you're so tired. They make you tired on purpose. And so you get up really early on retreat. Okay? And you don't eat much, maybe, depending on the, the format. So it's to, in a way to, to wear away at our coping mechanisms so that we can see that Coping in that way isn't useful. Right? It's much more to be open and spacious, to know that the field of awareness is vast. This, this sense of awareness we have is larger than anything, and in its vastness, everything is acceptable. Right? And everything, when you can note that it's just one of millions and billions and trillions of thoughts you've had in your lifetime, right? But is it worth the upsetness that comes when you believe it to be true? Right? So much effort, the insight we have on retreat is to see what thoughts I've hung on to and all the suffering, and how when I put it down, which in another way, let it go, or see it just what it is, just as a thought that's hurtful about ourselves or about other people. We also become less, less judgmental towards other people in our retreat. I will say on this retreat, right, I did the lunch dishes. And uh, there, um, basically, in the lunch, when you're doing lunch dishes, it's a little bit like, mm, I guess not really spirit rock. Maybe, I can't remember. It's been a few years and I've been. So mostly when you come as a yogi, the practitioner, you take your lunch dishes and you wash it, right, in that soap water, and then you put it in the, in the bucket over there, which is basically just a rinse water, and then they put it in racks that they put in the sanitizer, right? And then in this place, 
uh, IRC. To cut down on dishes, you're asked to keep a cup that then you put on a hook with your room number so that they don't have to wash, you know, 40 plus cups and all your plates and stuff every day. So, you know, you're asked to have a cup that you use. Wow. God damn it. <laughs> Some guy, right? Some guy every day at lunch, he would come, he would hold his plate like above the water and use, you know, the scrubber. Try not to touch the dirty soap water, even though they have a sink right there for you to wash your hand. Same thing with his fork and knife. He's like, it's gold watch, you know, this is my story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm playing it up for you. <laughs> and this was it. The tone is played up, right? For a couple days, it wasn't really played up. But anyways, so he's washing and then he would like, right? And then he would put his cup, same thing, in there. And it always was stained, of course, right? And then, and yeah, and then he would just walk away and go, he would do the same, right? And then one day, he even left his napkin right there, his <laughs> dirty napkin. And I found myself reaching across and wanting to throw it. <laughs> Not at him, but at the compost bucket where it's supposed to go, right? <laughs> Third day, so I'm noticing <clears throat> anger, right? So I go in and talk to Gilbert. Anyway, I worked through some stuff about it, which I'm not going to go into now. And after that, right, by the seventh day, it took seven days, maybe six, seven days, every time he came up, I would miss it if he didn't have a cup, right? In fact, I had a thought, he, he kind of got a big head, and I just thought of him like a bobblehead guy. You know? I mean, in a, in a kind, nice way, like a bobblehead. <laughs> Like, if it was a bobblehead of him, I'd buy one to collect it, to remind me, you know? Like, and I would just, seriously, I would just miss it when he didn't have a cup for me to wash, right? And so he just later relaxed, just like, it doesn't matter that I'm judgmental. Like, the guy's going to do it every day anyways, right? And so when you're not interacting and talking, then, of course, you know. Luckily, also, the, the, the door, the, the dish doorway is, you couldn't really see the person. I had a sense of who he was. <laughs> Try not to look up too much. So anyways, so when you realize, and this is part of practice, right? When you're just seeing your same thoughts about things over and over, and how in, in, a, in the silent interaction, right? You can't have a conversation about it. You can't say, hey, do you know what the rule is? You just, you just watch your thought going, yeah, how do you know what the rule is? Over and over, and then you're finally like, did it change anything? <laughs> no, except for I'm, you know, having agitation. And if my, if my, if one of my main goals is to have a sense of subtleness, and of course in an intensive retreat, that is the big goal, right? A sense of subtleness, and to watch how, when I have certain kinds of thoughts, that's a, that's a selfing thought about this person, right? You don't just have selfing thoughts about yourself. You have selfing thoughts about people, right? You look and you say, oh, he does this, so this must mean he's a, you know, X person. Mm -hmm. He wears that, so, oh, yeah, stay away from that, right? Mm -hmm. Or I want some more of that. Mm -hmm. But you have ideas about people and things, right? and yourself, then, too. So, so I think for, for me, the sense of seeing how our sense of um, ego by that, the sense of self, I, I like the word self. When we make a self out of it, and we solidify it. Again, having a sense of self is not the problem. Solidifying around it, and not letting ourselves or other people be more than just our idea of them. Even if it seems like the behavior reinforces your idea, right? This person has more, is much more than that. At the end, this person said it was the best retreat he's ever been on. <laughs> oh, and one time we, we were sitting on two layback chairs together doing meditation. He came up, and at first I was like, mm, in those days. But then, you know, half an hour. It was very cozy doing it together. 
So this is after the cow thing. The same way works for you, yourself as well. If you want to obtain perfect calmness in your zazen, you should not be bothered by the various images you find in your head, in your mind. Let them come and let them go. That's non-thinking. We just let thoughts be thoughts. Then it's our belief in the thoughts, right? Again, in the sense of queerness, if you think about how many beliefs did you have about yourself or what it meant to be queer, now you're just much more like lay back about it. Right? Doesn't mean they don't arise, but even if you go, ooh, I would not wear that as a, you know, lesbian or whatever, then you know, then you go, oh, judgment. Wow, that's useful. No, not at all. Right? So you're just much more flexible. Let them come and let them go. And then they will be under control. But this policy is not so easy. It sounds easy, but it requires some special effort. How to make this kind of effort is the secret of practice. Suppose you are sitting under some extraordinary circumstances. If you try to calm your mind, you will be unable to sit. And if you do not try to be disturbed, your effort will not be the right effort. The only effort that will help you is to count your breathing or to concentrate on your inhaling and exhaling. We say concentration, but to concentrate your mind on something is not the true purpose of Zen. The true purpose is to see things as they are, to observe things as they are, and to let everything go as it goes. Right? This doesn't mean, when we hear the true purpose is to see things as they are, that does not mean, oh yeah, that guy's an asshole. <laughs> He's truly an asshole. <laughs> yeah, truly an asshole. That's as it is. No, it just goes, oh yeah, that's a thought I'm having about this person. That's a thought. Or that's an emotion, anger. Or there's a sensation of wanting to throw. Right? <laughs> Zen practice is to open up our small mind, a contracted mind. The mind that is perseverating on details and thinking we want to control the details. Mostly I wanted to control him. So concentrating is just an aid to help you realize big mind. This is why every period of meditation in the beginning of every retreat, there's lots of concentration practice to settle the mind. The result of concentration is calm and settledness. To help you realize big mind, or the mind that is everything, the mind that's inclusive, the vastness of awareness that's inclusive, that everything is okay. Judging is okay as long as you just stop it. Let it, you see where it takes you and how it brings you more suffering than it does other people. And when you can see that, then you like, oh, judging mind, period. That's it. If you want to discover the true meaning of Zen in your everyday life, you have to understand the meaning of keeping your mind on your breathing and your body in the right posture in Zazen. You should follow the rules of practice and your study should become more subtle and careful. Only in this way can you realize the vital freedom of Zen. And he ends with, but perfect, with, excuse me, but perfect freedom is not found without some rules. People, especially young people, think that freedom is to do just what they want. That in Zen there is no need for rules. Remember he, a lot of, um, literally a lot of um, hippies came to sit with Suzuki Roshi in the beginning. But it is absolutely necessary for us to have some rules. But this does not mean always to be under control. As long as you have rules, you have a chance for freedom. By rules, it means like the form, some kind of container. The form, rules are in a way giving you a container. Practice, any practice. This, we had a container today. 10.30, everyone was in here. Right? Beginning of the bell, the end of the bell. So this is the, the container, the rules. As long as you have rules, you have a chance for freedom. To try to obtain freedom without being aware of the rules means nothing. It is to acquire this perfect freedom that we practice zazen. 
in a lot of ways we say zazen is um, non-conceptual, which is another way to realize that in the vastness of mind. You realize that being evaluative, comparative, discerning, yeah, it happens. And it's just really three things in the myriads of thousands and millions of things that your mind can do and can be aware of, like hope and joy and settledness and love and whatever, you know, so much. There's so much more here to our, our sense of awareness, be it about ourselves and other people or the world. Right? And so, more and more you practice, you realize, well, what is it that I'm willing to focus my attention on? Right? What is it that's important to remember, right? to keep on placing my awareness as opposed to the things that I know that will cause myself or other people suffering. Right. Thank you. Any questions or comments? As you know, I take challenges. Yes, Clint. Um, wow, this is such a great kind of talk. It really talks to me about my own issues. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so thank you for that. And um, my issue is obeying the social contract, mm. which means don't ask for all 20 flavor samples of ice cream when I'm waiting to get a cone. Or, uh. um, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't take 20 minutes in the bathroom when you can urinate in two minutes and I have to use it in, in the cafe and so on. Um, you know, I, I make light of it, but um, I, I never saw this conflict until recently saw my, I, maybe another Dharma talk, where they said, this judgment is just suffering. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm getting all high mind, but I mean, I'm suffering. I'm feeling anger and frustration. Um, but I see this as like part of my character or personality, all, at least all my adult life, maybe even longer. And I don't know how I can change it. I don't know if, it, if that's possible. And, and, uh, I want to, I mean, you talked a little bit about, about just naming it, saying this is judgment and so on. But can you go into a little more detail about how you deal with this, this rigid way of just judging people aren't, aren't adhering to some code of conduct and how terrible that is? Well, I don't have to say how terrible it is. You already feel it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm the same. I have similar. Um, well, like, like to be honest, like that whole story about the the person is, you know, my. I don't usually like to talk about my insights in retreat, and I'll, I'll just bring it up because it it really works. So part of. So okay, don't forget that one place. So delusion in psychology and in Buddhism has the same meaning. Delusion is a belief that you hold on to strongly and you believe to be true. In psychology, I would say, because reality, and reality tells you otherwise. Like, for instance, having a thought that you can walk on water is not a delusion. That's just a thought. When you go to walk out on water and you cannot walk on top of water and you sink, and then you keep saying, I can walk on water, now it becomes a delusion. Right? Because you fix on it and you believe it to be true, even though reality says otherwise. Right? Um, so, what we, what helps is, I would say being an aversive type too, is that um, a couple things, uh, I actually won't talk about my insight after all. What I will say is uh, that what I start to see, and here's the part why it's really difficult. And this is why, for the most part, most people who go on Vipassana retreats, unless you've been on long retreat, you're not really learning Vipassana, mm -hmm. right? Because Vipassana really means insight. And it is a kind of practice in which you start to see the pattern of your thoughts. And mostly it's very, all the agitation that comes up, uh, okay? So mostly what you're learning, for the most part, until you do really long retreats, is you're learning shamatha, 
you're learning concentration so that it's a settledness. And you have to have that first. That's why you don't get vipassana, right? Every, so, so you're learning to have that calmness. And, it's, and when you go on a, at least a seven-day retreat, maybe in a five, you can get it. This is why after, for most people, in the third or fourth day is when you start <coughs> to relax because the result of concentration is literal mental and emotion, uh, uh, mental, emotional and body ease, which could include sleepiness if it collapses the energy, right? The energy then becomes much calmer and settled. And in that, then you start to practice. And you literally, it's kind of like you, you, the water is calm and then you start to throw in pebbles, and then boulders <laughs> and stuff. Metta is both a concentration and a vipassana, all the Brahma Bahar, because the part you, we forget about metta that you don't really know until you practice it a lot is that it's a purifying practice also. Right? Mostly in little things like this, we think, oh, kindness, loving kindness, compassion, blah, 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 which I ruin up. But anyways, so, and, and that's because in wanting kindness, when you really do it in a regular way, you will see where it is that you aren't kind. Right? I was in a two month at Spiro, when I went to one, and I, uh, a guy that went there with me at the end, right? He was saying, oh yeah, I did metta for two months, and I thought I'd be all like, ooh, you know, love everyone, and he's a very aversive guy, right? He just complained about Tassar the whole <laughs> practice period, right? And he knew that, right? Um, and he said, no, all I saw was all oh, where I was angry at people and hated people and what it did to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's considered purifying practice because, and this is why you have to be really careful with that, right? And so, bottom line, Lynch, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that we have to see, um, actually, for, for most of us, um, we have to see where it is that it hurts us. Actually, that's the first place. Because you have to see it in the very sense of when your mind is contracted and going, oh, should, 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 should. Mm -hmm. There is a certain sense of contraction and also the heart, in my opinion. Um, uh, so that it feels really uncomfortable, the judgmental mind, yeah. right? That you then go, oh. And then you have that the subtleness in which then you can experiment and go, oh, not just go straight to metta because you want to get rid of it. Here's the that's this is why this is a difficult thing about serious practice. Because you have to be able to sit through all the difficulty of seeing how when I judge, right, I tighten up. And then most of us, and it's true of everything judgment, anything, even pretty things, it's true. And on a certain level, you have to get to a story you have about what it is that is the hook that makes you judge. My sense, I don't know about you at all, my sense when I judge is that often I'm not allowing myself to do that. I get annoyed at people who take a long time because I think I was really taught, you should not take up so much space, you should not take up other people's time. You should clean the seat after you sit on it, blah, 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 right? right? All the shoulds that you're supposed to do. And it's not enough to be reactive to it. That's the thing, right? It's not enough to like, oh, my fucking mother or dad told me to do that, so now I'm not going to do it. Because then that's still being reactive. And it is not something that from your wish to live a non-harming way towards yourself or other people, that you go, oh, all right, when I make a mess in the kitchen, yes, mom did say, don't leave stuff out. But I can see that my mind is more settled when I come in, right? Or it's not worth, even though I know that that's useful, my girlfriend is a messy person, and so <laughs> me telling her what to do all the time is mm -hmm. much. Maybe then I, then you practice maybe asking in a way. Then you also practice you know, not sighing every time. <laughs> you find that. Many a morning, Deb's like, I hear you sighing in there, right? And then, you know, or you sigh less and less, or you just start to go, oh, okay. 
And you, you feel the agitation, but you know it's an old agitation. That's the other thing. You know it's an old agitation, and it does not need to go any further. <coughs> and that takes, a, that takes practice. My, my sense mostly being an aversive type is that mostly I don't allow myself many things. I guess how Gil, you know, last year was the first year. Like, they have, they have two, um, not quite lazy boy, but those kind of armchairs outside the meditation hall there. And I've been going, this is my fifth year there. Three years, I was always like, well, lazy ass people, right? <laughs> too comfortable, what, 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 you know? And they oh yeah, judgment, judgment, right? Last year, I had a major breakthrough on some stuff. But it took till I was, uh, co-teaching in the teacher hall that was one too, and so the co-teacher and I went to sit in one, and I was like, this thing is so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And so my whole thing going on this retreat, okay, I'm going to be kind to myself, I'm going to be relaxed, and oh yeah, and I told you, oh yeah, it took me over 20 years to do a real Vipassana retreat, right? Like, you know, drink tea, doing meditation, because I had, you know, stuff come up that I just needed to relax. Um, and so this time, I went one period, I just went in there and lay down on that thing. It was so comfortable. It was really great. And a lot of it, Gil even had to say, just take a break. I was going in there, you know, because in this style, you turn your mind and you watch your awareness, right? And it has to be in a relaxed enough manner, right? And I, and I was so, like trying so hard to relax, right? <laughs> and then you'll find one way that seemed to relax your mind, and then every time you're like trying to do the same thing, and so you just tighten up. Then I was practicing shikantaza, letting go, but then I just got so confused. Which, which style am I supposed to be doing? So I went into him, and he's like, 10 minute PD only, right? And somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle, he said, take a break. By the end, I'm like, what am I supposed to do when I'm confused? Right, because my thing is over efforting. This is part of the aversive percent. When you try hard and it doesn't work, you just try harder, right? But it doesn't really work for that type. For some type, it does work because your t tendency is like, fuck, I'm not going to do anything. Then this is why we have to know our patterns. This is why concentrating and noticing, then noticing its effect on us. And then you have, here's the hard part. You have to commit to un be willing to have, try a different way. And that's the hard part, because your mind will just keep going there. Because remember, we talk about how the mind has grooves, mm -hmm. and you have to lay new groove tracks, which takes time to have its own groove. And so mostly, you have to learn to see the grooves, and then let the grooves just be grooves, not follow mm -hmm. that ball down the groove, right? that thought that keeps going. That's why practicing, you know, you have to also learn not to only identify what's going on, you, you have to learn to have the ability to do those kind of meditations. So it isn't enough, you know, to know, oh, that's concentration. Oh, that's shikantaza. It's to be able to do it, right? And at every retreat, you're gonna be go finding the same places where you have to practice letting go. That's your version of letting go. And then it changes too. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I will say the other thing to be aware of is the absence. This is the thing we forget. Because we, for over our further, we forget. When is it that you don't judge? Mm -hmm. Remember those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and rest there and go, oh, yeah, yay. Or you judge and then you just went, Shh, right? And you go, oh. Take a breath. Oh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you can just go. Okay, you see somebody asking for 20 tastes of ice cream flavor? Let yourself have 10 tastes. <laughs> Seriously. Let that be okay. Bring a friend with you that will be behind you so that you can. Seriously. You know, this is the other thing. Maybe I think it's my zenness. I start to go, oh, I really need to do certain things, even though it seems silly, because there's something in the body that also needs to. And it's not enough in our mind. We think the mind will save us, but it will not. Because if it could, we would all be saved by now. And if anything, <laughs> right? Yes. 
Tell me your name. Thomas. Thomas. Thank you so much. So, um, is there some place, are there instances where this observing of the thoughts and letting them go is simply not enough? Um, is, is what? The, simply not enough? Simply not enough. Mm. In, in other words, so an example being like you're in a job or in a relationship, and the thoughts are like, my needs aren't being met. Mm. You know? No, I, you know, okay, so those are just thoughts. Like, okay, but I have a need for being understood and accepted, or tenderness, or, you know, compact, you know, these sorts of things. Those are all thoughts. They're just mental formations. But they're real. I mean, those needs are perhaps real in a way. So, you know, do we resign ourselves to, like, oh, those are just thoughts. I don't really have needs. I don't, you know, like, <laughs> subvert all that. Mm-hmm. So, can you talk a little bit about Yeah, sure. Um, I forget another one koan is um, <clears throat> some, someone once asked the Buddha, what is the teaching of the entire, your entire lifetime? Right? Or someone once asked a teacher, what is, is the Buddha's, what is the Buddha's teaching of an entire lifetime? And the response is an appropriate response. Right? So most of us when we hear it, we go, oh, what is the appropriate response? Right? You think it's and, like one, right? Also, let me just figure out which is one. Let, letting go. <laughs> letting go is the one. Or, you know, oh, it's just a thought. And we try to go, okay, it's like this, and then we put on every situation. So it really is um, what might be an appropriate response here. And are we willing to be committed to it? So this is the thing, right? This is why, and this is why subtleness is so important to start with. I don't care. Okay, I won't speak for the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care how practiced you are. Every meditation period should have concentration. Every retreat will you'll be taught concentration at some point, or you should be doing it because you have to have that subtleness so that you can have a sense of flexibility. We all know this. When we're feeling at ease, when we feel safe, when we feel some sense of settleness, then we're willing to go, something comes up, and we go, oh. And then the only difference in some, some sense in a retreat is when you've committed to following that thought or, or placing some importance on what's going on. Right? We had a practice container. So then you say, okay, I, I, so one, you're willing to sit still and observe it a little bit, or some time, more, the longer the better. Okay? Remember, Buddhists gain patience with practice. So you have a thought, my needs are not being met. So one, you're will, you need to be willing to sit with it for a while to see, um, is it, it's just a thought in the sense that if one way to understand that is just a thought, which doesn't, here's a big difference, doesn't make it not valid, really key, right? That's the other thing. We think, oh, when, when you hear, oh, it's just a thought, it means it's not valid. No, it just means in the moment, is it a thought that one, most of us have thoughts that we carry around and we place on things, right? So if, if you can see that your thought, I am not getting my needs met, is one that you have numerous times, hundreds of times every day, then it's probably like a lens that you put in front. Right? So when you're willing to go, oh, this is a lens. And right? so one way in which I was kind of talking about with Clint is in meditation or in practice, you start bringing the lens up, you see, oh, there's that lens again. And then you have to be willing, the two ways of working with it. One, you have to be willing to see, oh, that's a lens I carry a lot. And what happens with me when I have this lens? Where is all the uncomfortableness? Which for many of us is also the fucking emotions that go with it. Because there was a story in which, you know, dad or mom or caretaker say, your needs are not important. Mm-hmm. Or your needs need to be second to other people. Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to let that one or many stories, but really there's one 
main one. That, and you have to go through it. You can't just go, oh yeah, that one's related to that one. This is why therapy on one level is really useful, but, and you have to have, unfortunately in therapy and in, in practice, in my experience, is that the emotional reaction has to be felt because that's a little bit of trauma you just experience back whenever. So you have to, the body has to release it. This is also why you can have a lot of heat in retreat, right? It's just stuff is just like, right? All the magma needs to like be released basically. Or I don't know why. Geology, anyways. So you have to see, oh, where is it in me? And what might be the story? And then feel it. This is the part that many of us won't go. This is what <coughs> spiritual bypass, right? So, so you have to feel that so they can feel the, what is the thing that will support you with that? For instance, if it's a sense of that my needs are not being met, then perhaps it is about, oh, Where else is it that I'm not, I'm not giving myself the need? Right? One, one retreat, I had a sense in which, oh my God, a, this retreat, I had one in which, okay, I was, you know, because I'm an over effort it's 14 days, so, you know, things rise, you have, Things go well, then of course they go not so well again. So I many times I was a little bit confused what I was supposed to do because I'm like always trying to, you know, relax or do whatever. So I got confused, so then I thought, ah, oh, okay, I'm gonna treat my meditation like when I have a meditation, a practice discussion with my students, right? In a practice discussion, my role, I always say to my students, in a practice discussion, there's two things that are happening. One is the tangible, and one is the intangible. The tangible is, you know, you come in, you bring anything about your <coughs> practice, be it on the cushion or in your life, and you bring it up, or a Dharma point, and we talk about it. And then the intangible is that it's a way in which two people can meet completely, right? which is already happening, but it's a way for us to know it. Right? And so my role when you come in is I, I create, or I'm holding the field of awareness, you know, I'm not, and since it's Zenish, I tend to just, once I explain that the first time, every time you come into a practice discussion, then I just sit there, holding the field of awareness, and then you bring up whatever, right? If I have something to talk to you about, I'll wait till the end. But in the field of awareness, <coughs> right, you could sit quietly, you could do whatever. I'm just trying to hold the field of kindness, of compassion, of acceptance, or whatever comes up. Everything is possible in this space, the vastness of awareness, so to speak. So I was thinking that, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what I should do with my, you know, trying to practice. Mm -hmm. Then I have, oh, wait, I don't do that to myself, to my own experiences. I'm not always so kind and compassionate and caring about what comes up, right? I'm always working too hard or trying to do this and that. So I should be a teacher to my And it was like a, you know, like that's a thought out here. You're all like, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds good. But I really, I was like bawling because it was so, like how much of my time I'm not caring for myself, right? So that's one, and then two, the yeah, other would be to um, practice really um, more actively. This is the off the cushion, and this is why practice programs are really great. And really, I did not mean to be pushing my April Path practice program, but this is exactly what we're going to do in the April Path. You need to find some way in which you actively um, work on the. I think it's a really. Um, Miss, what I go as far to say misuse, not fully using practice when we think that it is all about um, what's on the cushion or that it's all lovey-dovey. I really hate to say it. Um, so much of practice is about um, uh, investigative, right? That's, that's kind of the vipassana part of practice. Right? 
And so you have to find containers in which it's done, not just like, you know, therapy is a kind of container, but it's not the same as, as pra a practice container because um, it has that quality of having that stillness and that vastness of awareness that goes with it. It's not so much about problem solving, it's about seeing how things are and seeing if you can just be with them and let them take their course. Because mostly in our life we're like, ooh, that happened. How do I divert myself from it, or how do I fix it, or how do I control it in some way? Whereas a lot of practice is about letting things come up and letting them run their course that we didn't let that happen before. Yes. Sure. We're out of time. Sure. Yeah, you can talk to me over there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank, Thank you very much. Um, Please stay and enjoy the uh, fellowship of the song. Um, do we have we have a host today? Yes. So there's tea and refreshments. Um, and did you put your cup in the dishwasher or just in the sink? And I'll put it in the dishwasher for you. I'm going to come around with a donable. Our contribution is ten to twenty dollars. Um, we appreciate your generosity. It helps with all of our expenses. And if you are new, there's a sign-up sheet if you want to be included in our membership list and we will be on our contact information. I just point out that there are a few things. Um, there's some reading material outside. Um, next week is our uh, retreat and um, I guess there are still spaces available. Yes, so there are a few ways. We need to know some of them later. So there's information about the uh, retreat out there. On um, November 17th, Sunday, November 17th, will be a memorial for Hal Hershey at the Columbarium. So there's um, information about that um, out on the coffee table. And um, on November 10th, uh, Sister Mary Peter and myself will be um, doing the Dharma, the Dharma talk. And, um, the subject is fuck coping. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of McMindfulness. So there's a meeting that's right over there. Um, I hope there's a, we hope that it'll be a provocative discussion. So, um, any other uh, announcements? Next week will be open discussion. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, and um, happy birthday, Grisha. Oh. Yay. Anybody else's birthday? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so can we gather for the dedication of merit? <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.